Welcome to this weekend's Bucky call. And um, we're excited to be here. We've had a couple of um, emails. Uh, one thing that I thought that I would share is that Ann Tam is going to be missing three days, but Ann is on, in three weeks. On the third, the third week, she's doing this reality TV show. So I've checked in with her to see if there's any way we can support her in whatever she's doing. So, uh, she, so Ann is one who sends her best and tells us what she's doing. So Joe, you were on the call today. How are you feeling, and what do you expect out of our call tonight for today? Uh, I'm feeling grateful uh, to be here, and um, yes, uh, I'm excited to kind of resolve some of the some of the uh, issues that we talked about a little bit before, Steve. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm excited about uh, having coming away with more answers and uh, continuing to see. Uh, to see and understand uh, a you know, more and more uh, about uh, the geometry of thought and how it applies to everyday life. So I'm excited about that. So Susan, how do you feel? And what would you like to take out of today? Nice to see you. Oh, I'm so excited to not be on call at this moment. So I get to stay with you folks and not have to split my attention. And I am grateful beyond measure for the fact that Kelly's feeling well enough to be with us. I am expecting that I will gain more understanding and move my perspective. And Kelly, I still remember meeting you for the first time. I still remember the first time that you came out and went to get in my vehicle and had to wade through the Diet Coke cans. And, uh, and you used that, at, you anchored that moment and you took my understanding of my own present into my past, into my future, gave, helped me recognize that I had a choice. Um, certainly many questions and many choices that could be made along the way, but I am forever grateful for you stopping a moment and making it a crystalline reality and a and a possibility. Bon Butler, how do you feel and what would you like to get out of today? Morning, Susan. Morning, everybody. Like you, it's great to see Kelly here. Hi, Kelly. Uh, I'm feeling good. A lovely day in Perth today. I've had a walk in Hyde Park amongst the big trees, which is a beautiful way to start the day. Been listening to Eckhart Tolle and feel really in the mood to. Uh, cope with Bucky, hopefully. So uh, feeling great and hope to learn a little bit more about Bucky because it just keeps going. There's always another layer, a bit more to learn. So who hasn't gone yet? Raffers, mm. you've gone? Just nope. you still. No, Raffers hasn't. Okay, good morning, Raffers. How do you feel? What do you want to take out of today? Well, I feel great again. I'm very happy to have Kelly with us today again. <clears throat> and also great to, because he was sharing that he's feeling better than last week. So. Again, it's always great to have you around, Kelly. And uh, and again, I also I just remember actually the first day I met Kelly. F funnily enough, I met Kelly simultaneously with Henry Lee. That was quite an experience. I, <laughs> I mean, anyway, I was and then well, a lot of things happened. Actually, excited about the fact that funnily enough, I'm going to be running a a cash flow session on Tuesday trying to show people, you know, the world of employment versus the world of uh, building a business. While well, we run some financial education as well. So we do my, my best to reflect on what I've learned. And so it will be yes, Kiyosaki's version of cash flow, but a more expanded version of, of what the game actually means. And well, let's see how that goes. And what they expect today is so again, to keep to keep exploring. I don't think naturally that we need to dumb to dumb things down because I just think people we are not dumb at all. On the contrary, I mean we are thinking individuals, and what we need is is to to follow on what Steve is doing, which is making Bucky more accessible, which is very different to dumbing things down. I don't believe in dumbing things down personally. I think we need to deal with the complexity and go through the the pain and through the pain there's gain and and learning and expansion. So 
So I look forward, very much look forward to today's session and exploring more, you know, the visible, the invisible, the gifts of freedom, but all this, this crazy world of Bucky, which I actually enjoy enormously. Um, so that's it for me. So Kelly, my friend, how do you feel and what do you expect to get out today? Well, <clears throat> I'm feeling somewhat better. I'm still, you know, in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, I, I can understand things as they're going, but as soon as they've gone through, I forget them. So mm. um, my memory is getting better and mm. I'm so glad to be here with you guys. Uh, and I'm just glad to hang on and hang out. So <laughs> that's how I feel. Uh, is it Manu now? Manu, how yeah. do you feel? And what do you expect? Hey, I really feel glad. I'm glad that you're here for the second time in a row. You know, that's already a milestone. I'm also grateful that everybody's here. Um, I, I, I always, I'm, I'm always humbled by the fact that, you know, you could be a little dot, but with many other dots, you start feeling like you are many dots. And you expand, and more, more, more importantly, you pull that back to where you are, and then you you apply it, and that's the most I'm getting from our gathering, is to understand a little bit about something and make it significant, you know, in the locale in where we are, and that's. To me, the most important thing that we individually together and with others who are willing to can get from this because it's so vast. So that's what I expect that we progress to today. And uh, Ajobin? Yeah, I am the guy. Okay, Steve. How do you feel? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, when you, when you said the little dot, that's exactly how I was feeling. So uh, I, I won't, you know, I'll, I'll just embrace my little dotness, you know, but understand that that little dotness uh, is infinite. Okay. And um, I, I really enjoyed Raffer's talking about the visible and the invisible because tonight, and I think that's been my issue with this whole conversation with Bucky, is understanding that parts of what he's talking about are visible and the other part is invisible and I'm not used to looking at it. And so I don't, there's a part of me that doesn't even want to see it, but uh, I'm working through the math, I'm working through the metaphors and I'm going to see what we can do um, to do this. I. And Susan, your thing about your experience with Kelly and the idea of the present and it, that my present is my past and my future and where do I want to be in the present, um, that really kind of, to me, kind of really addresses the topology of this whole Bucky conversation is that um, to me, to, to really be able to apply the geometry of thought, the geometry of beingness, I really need to step out and, and take a look at, at the past, the present, and the future, and be in that kind of a paradigm, and not be stuck just in my one little slot, not stick in my past. So I'm, I'm praying today I'm going to come out of that past, and I'm going to see new things I haven't seen before. And I'm very honored to be leading this discussion. I wish I uh, knew more, but all I can do is just lead, and we're just going to do some Bucky reading and see what comes out. So here we go. Um, any comments or questions on what we've done in the past that are like burning for you right now? Because we're going to jump into our next reading, which is triangles. And frankly, we're leaving lines behind because there's a problem with lines that I don't get, but I think the answer is in the triangle. So we're going to see. So Steve, on, yeah. the, on the line thing, I will tell you that we were looking at the diagram from cosmography. Yes. As, as a reference. And yeah. what I loved is that the lines, even between two dots, are curved. Yeah. 
And if you start to look at reference and it's like, we begin to forget the reference, but we live on a sphere and we are in relation to that iron core crystal in the center of the earth, which is a definition of 1D. And so I, you know, as we finished up our Wednesday talk and we were kind of looking at how do we move into this conversation that we're going to have tonight, it was definitely burning for me that Bucky decided to represent the distance between two points as a curved line, not a straight line. And yeah. what kind of possibilities does just that little nuance open up for me? Yeah. Um, can be, could be pretty amazing. And as you, and you see it as you move down through the next dimensions. Okay. <clears throat> the comment that I make here is that, um, um, Steve just pronounced a word that takes something on me. He says, he said that, he says Becky's topology. When you say Becky's topology, the implication is that Bucky's will or that universe is not thorn. It's not thorn. Is a continuum. Is always the relationship. The second comment that Susan made here is that Bucky, in choosing this representation here, especially on the second column of what is shown on no, no, the second column, the second one. Oh, not, this. Not, Oh, this column. Yes, yes. Is because everything is about relationships in terms of in Bucky's language. When he talks about unity, is unity of relationship. It's not unity of objects. It is relationship always, always, always. A thought is a relationship. Duality is a relationship. All the forms that we talk about are relationships that close. That's what it is. That's the first comment that I will make to this. Yeah. Well, you know, Susan, this is terrible because as, uh, as clever as I think I am, uh, I, I did not see that line between A and B as a curved line. I saw it as a straight line. I, I had my empty Coke bottles in my seat. <laughs> you just, you just, you destroyed my Coke bottles. <laughs> They'll never be the same. That, even though it's point A and point B, it is a curved line. Mm -hmm. Wow. Been rocking my world, baby. Wow. <laughs> just like so, um, Kelly's been rocking my world since 2007. Yeah. So get rid of the freaking empty Coke cans and get rid of the straight lines because they don't help one see the present moment clearly, right? Wow, there's my epiphany. I'm ready to leave the call today. That's all there is to it, <laughs> really. This is gonna change. I mean, I have drawn so many diagrams with state lines between A and B. I can't even tell you, I have to go repent. I have to get, I don't think there's a, I, there's no penance, good enough. So thank you for bringing this up. What well, an epiphany. Go Steve. ahead, what? Remember, yeah. Bucky talked about the illusory yeah. infinite plane. Yeah. And it's yeah. An illusion and it's a plane and its infiniteness is also an illusion. Its yeah. planarness is also an illusion. Yeah. It's the so. best approximation of our perception that yeah. exactly. can do standing on a curved surface. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, when you think about concave and convex, it's also about curves. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, we're gonna see, we're gonna hear about that tonight. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> really good. Oh, I see what's wrong. Maybe it's my no. Okay, good. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll tackle the reading. Um, here we go. So I want to leave lines behind. Well, we can read lines and I'll tell you what my problem is. And then we can be thinking about that when we move over into triangles, okay? So Mr. John Butler, I hate to uh, miss the opportunity of having you uh, share. Thank you, Steve, that's all right. all right. Would you like me to read lines? Yes, please. And just, we can okay. start right there. Yep, line. A line has two 
vertexes with angles around each of its vertexial ends equal to zero degrees. Yeah. The sum of these angles is zero degrees. The sum of the vertexes, two times angular unity, 360 degrees is 720 degrees. The remainder of zero from 720 degrees is 720 degrees or two unities or one tetrahedron. Quad okay. erat demonstrandum. Yeah. So let's examine this then. Some of it's pretty obvious, I think, but there are a couple of elements that are not so obvious to me, at least. So I have, I have this broken down. For me, doing Bucky one sentence at a time is the only way I'm going to get it done. So here's the first sentence then. John, do you want to read just that first sentence and let's yeah, Sure. A line has two vertexes with angles around each of its vertexial ends equal to zero degrees. So who wants to explain that? So I'm going to challenge that. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, they're zero degrees, but they're also 360 60 degrees. degrees yeah. yep, yep. And, and unity is plural at a minimum of two, and everything starts at one and divides. So both are possible answers. And I, think that, I know Manu is going to get me all straightened out. I got you. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I'm, I'll go about it experientially. I'm an ant. There is a thread, right? Mm -hmm. And there are two kind of, there are two, there are two globes at the end of a thread. And then I have my two eyes, I'm seeing left and I'm seeing right, and they start coming down, coming down, coming down until it fuses. That is the point to me. Huh. You get it? I have, this is it. And then I'm between, it comes like that, comes like that, comes like that, and then that's the point. Remember that Becky never talked anything that doesn't have an implied volume. When the concave and the convex of my world become one, I'm fused in the sphere, it is a point. So is this what Susan said when she said there's zero degrees in this vertexial angle at this point, but there's 360 degrees around the outside that is not being considered when I look at the zero degreeness of the vertex? No, there is. 1440 here. There is 1440 here. I'm in between. And it's coming together, coming together, coming together. I'm a small guy in between that. It comes together until it takes me and makes me into that 720. So at that point, I'm, I'm part of a dot. And I'm 720. Is that the idea of collapsing? Yes, it is collapsing. In. Right. So the notion of a line is always a notion at a limit. Take what we call con convex concave. So two globes coming together, when they touch each other, it is concave, uh, convex con uh, concave. Even though it is curved like this and like that, what you see as in between, in the middle, you just see a dot or you see a line, a straight line, illusionary straight line, locally. Okay, does anybody want to explain what Manu just said in other words? <laughs> We can continue because I think this is going to come up several times in this conversation. Uh, Manu, would you say that the zero degreeness of this uh, vertex at the end of this line has a convex relationship or a concave relationship with the 360 degrees that's illusory? The zero degree is the tetrahedron that has disappeared. And you are in the other tetrahedron of 720 degree left. 
That is exactly what I did not want you to say. <laughs> okay, oh, good. I love it. <laughs> okay, good. Because it because says that at it the is, end. It is always a concave and a convex. Remember that. That's the consequence of saying that everything is curved. Mm -hmm. When you say everything is curved, curve means that there is concave and, and convex. They can and be that, apart from this, but that's what curve right. means. It means both convex and concave simultaneously. Yes. When, they, the when they come extremely close together, yeah. one disappears. Mm -hmm. And you find yourself in the remainder, in the, in the 720 degrees. That's why I say demonstrated zero around that unity, one has disappeared and 720 is left. That is the tetrahedron. All if right. you read what you say. We're going to read what he says. We just read the first sentence. Susan, you started to say something there. Oh, I'm, I'm typing it. It's the event horizon. Ah. For, for me, event horizon is the only way I can, can organize this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to just go crazy. I like event horizon. So if I have point one and I have point two, hang on a second. I'm going to get to the universal applicator here. They're magnets, damn it, and they just don't do what you think they're going to do. They always do something else. They come out of the box like that, yeah. Yeah, no kidding. So a line rep has no dimension. A line is an imaginary representation of the distance between these two points. When I'm a Western guy, I draw a straight something between these two points. But if I'm Bucky, I will draw a curved something between these two points because the energy isn't going straight here. The energy is going around this way and around this way simultaneously. Have I said everything okay so far, Manu? On cave and convex, baby. Yep. All right. And so now my question is this. I, the, the concave and con convex is vertically dissect these two points. It's not over and under, as I would think. It's vertically between. The concave and convex is vertically between these two points. Is that correct, Manu? Yes. Let me, let me put it again to clear. The way, just hold it the way you are. Phil. Okay. When does your eye see? You have two eyes. I have two eyes. Each of them has a certain image. Okay. And depending on your focal, at a certain point, the two point, the two fuse to make an object that you that record. True. That is true. Okay. You're always looking at Manu with two eyes. Yeah. There are two different unless channels. I, unless I do this. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. <laughs> but you make a point that I'm Manu yeah. when yeah. it collapses yeah. into a yeah. zero, into a point right. in your mind. And, and then if you I'm focus. not using two eyes, I don't focus on whatever I'm looking at. It's very important to have two eyes to do that. So you're saying metaphorically, at least, that 720 is here and 720 is here. And that makes 1440 out there. Is that what yeah. you're metaphorically saying? Yes. And, yes. Uh, but you see, you see, you see, when you are looking at it, you right. manifest it into 720, uh -huh. into a tetrahedron, into a physical. I manifested a 720, and un, an invisible is another 720. So yes. The the part, you are, remember that you always say you can't see four degrees in a four degree world. You have yeah. to knock out something. Yeah. You see it in a three degree world. Yeah. Physical world. Okay. And I think more words we read are going to reinforce what Manu has just said. Are we ready? Any comments or questions before we continue? Okay, here we go. Next line, Sir John. Yes. The sum of these angles is zero degrees. Everybody has that, right? Yes. Zero plus zero is zero. Mm -hmm. Voila. <laughs> okay. Remember, in Bucky's language, zero is the same as 720. They are congruent. Mm -hmm. 
uh, 1440. Zero and 1440 is the same. Zero and 1440 is the same, or zero and 720 the same? No, zero and 1440. Zero is twice, 720. Okay. In the dime, in a wine dance, you go 720 twice to come back to the same position, zero. Mm -hmm. Right. So everybody remembers the wine dance, right? Yes, yes. Okay, good, because that that cup starts here goes over here comes under here and comes out again and that's that double the double concave and convex manifesting in one movement and bucky doesn't say collapse bucky says nature tucks does a tuck he uses the word tuck and he uses some other word that i can't remember right now anybody else you remember the word that he uses he doesn't say collapse he says, I'll look it up in a minute. Okay, next sentence. Go ahead, John, if you would. The sum of the vertices, two times angular unity, 360 degrees, is 720 degrees. So my comments or questions? <laughs> but it, it just said what we say. The sum of what you see but what is not seen, or if you take what you see from what is not seen, you are left with a tetrahedron, 720 degrees. I missed it. Please say that again. Okay. We say that the zero were two spheres that came too close together. Okay. That's what we call zero. You come back to the same point. So that zero is the same as 1440. So if from that 1414, you take out the 720 that is metaphysical that you don't see, you are left with what you see, that is a tetrahedron, 720 degrees. Yeah, we're gonna to get to the tetrahedron on the next line and I'm not there yet. So- But, but, but you understand the 720 degree left, the collapse. Because of the collapse. Yes. The sum of the vertexes, and there are two vertexes. Yeah. In the previous text that we read, unity. Becky, Becky used the word elimination of 700. He said yeah, the he universe always operates by elimination of 720 degrees. That's right. When he talks about the tuck, the other word was the elimination of 720 degrees and tucking and collapse. It's all the same. Okay. The sum of the vertexes, and there are two vertexes times angular unity. And so the definition of angular unity is 360 degrees, which is a sphere. And that's why that line represents those two spheres, because that line represents an imagine, it's the distance between those two. And there's your 720. John, if you would. But one point here. What? Whenever Becky talks about angular unity, is talking in 2D. Remember okay. that. So when Bucky is talking about angular unity, he's talking about 2D or two-dimensional reality. Is that what yes. you just said? Yes. Okay. So the remainder of zero degrees from 720 degrees is 720 degrees or two unities or one tetrahedron, QED. So that's what you said just a few minutes ago, Mono, that it ends yes. up with one tetrahedron. But understand it very well, I, I insist on this. When you talk about action and reaction, action, reaction, we don't see reaction. All we see is our vector of action, right? But the two are of exact magnitude that is the energy of one equal the quantum of the energy of the other the other thing is that the other one is convex is hidden and the two are in equilibrium the zero degree here is equilibrium okay. dynamically okay. so when you bring two forces in opposition dynamic 
and they are equal in magnitude. They are in equilibrium. That is zero. The angle of veering is zero from that one. Have I made myself clear? Has he made himself clear? Comments, questions? I understand it until I get down to your questions. <laughs> and then I'm going to want to work through them individually. Yeah, I, I think what, what I'm trying to say here, let us forget that we never in statics, we always dynamic. It's always moving. So zero is a zero of motion. It's vectors that come together, hold one another in a way that is equanimous at that time. It's just equanimous. The sum total of all the vectors coming in there is zero. OK. All right. So let's tackle these questions one at a time. I Go ahead. Uh, no, I mean, so. Uh, zero in motion. Could you explain what that means exactly? Well, because may I attempt to explain it? Yes, everything is everything is in motion. We have six degrees of freedom. We have everything in motion. It's spinning, you know, right. Soviet okay. P. It's spinning, okay. it's orbiting, it's expanding, contracting, it's torquing and reverse torquing, and it's in precession. Everything is in motion. And so two zeros coming together, these two vertexes coming together are, or any one vertex is energy in motion. Did that make sense, Manu? Yeah, I mean, let's just put it this way. Um, Joe, if we are doing, right, if you put your hand on your desk, right? right? Down the desk. Your hand on the de your desk where you are not. It is yeah. at rest, right? That's right. What is that rest? How do you define the rest of what? How do I define rest? Um, it, why uh, is it at rest? Why do you say it's at rest? It wants to move because gravity, we know that gravity is always, gravity is pulling it further. But what makes it that it looks like there is no motion? Just my sight, my um, what makes it look like it's not in motion? Yeah. Uh, just uh, I guess just my yeah, my sight that that's what I what I'm seeing, what I'm observing. Is that right? It is because gravity is what you call sentry. Peto, Sandri Peto, is pulling towards a center. You call it Sandri Peto, right? But your spinning generates what you call centrifugal, is going away from the center. And that Sandri Peto, right? The Sandri Peto is what you see, is the gravity. The centrifugal, it is hidden. It doesn't see it's radiating. It's pulling it the other way. And the two balance in terms of magnitude. So remember that it's always a sphere touching another sphere. Okay. And it looks, it looks to you. You are in between here. That's why the, your desk is in between the surface of your desk. Locally, you see it flat. It is not flat, it is curved. Okay. But, and that's, that is in what you call equilibrium. That's what we're talking about. Always have in mind that subtlety. Bucky is not talking about objects that are on their own, you know, lifeless and somewhere there. It is things that are moving and then interchanging, bonding, doing all kinds of things. Energy is always being exchanged. Comments, questions? Mm -hmm. I, I found the exact quotes of Bucky 
on what normal scientists say is collapse of the field. And I created a little lexicon for myself. It, when a quantum physicist says the observer collapses the wave function in order to create reality, Bucky says that it is the elimination of 720 degrees of angle, or he says, nature takes two complete 360 degree angular tucks. Those are the words that Bucky uses to describe the collapse of the wave function and this idea of convex, concave, visible, not visible. Did I say that correctly, Mato? Yes. Wonderful. I just thought those words, I like to quote Bucky and use those words. So, <clears throat> so when we come back to this, how many degrees in angular, are we ready for these questions? Yes. Is, all right. How many degrees are there in angular unity? 360. Huh? Angular unity is 360. Right, Manu? Yeah. Are, we, are we there? In reference to a two-dimensional system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah. So you have to put context in there. In reference to a 2D system. Yes, we are on a plane there. Ah, a planar system. Mm -hmm. That would be another another synonym we could use in there. A two D system slash or planar planar system. Planar, yes. Okay. Everybody has that then, right? How yep. many degrees are in angular unity? It's 360 degrees in a two-dimensional perspective or a planar system. That should be a quote. Please correct that at the end, yeah. That's it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, John. I'm I'm with you on that. And I, I would want to have that corrected if I'd missed it. So thank you for speaking right up. Next question. Go ahead, John, if you like. How many degrees of angular unity are in a line? I think there are 720. Okay. And and John, let's why? Why are there 720? Two vertexes. Well, Manu, okay, because the sum of two vertexes. All right, good. 720 degrees. Uh, because the sum of two vertexes. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Everybody there? Yep. Next one, guys. John, if you want to? Yep. How many degrees of angular unity are two unities? 1440. 14, 14, yeah. 1440, 14, yeah. Mm. Is that in a two dimensional universe? No. That's now in three. No, now you're in three dimensional. Now we're in 3D. Yeah. I think this uh, differentiating here, uh, 2D and 3D, is really helping my brain. I hope it's helping everybody else's brain as much as it's helping my brain. Okay, good. So 1440. Actually, it is actually it is in 4D. What's that? Four dimension. It is in four dimensions, huh? Question mark. I actually feel good about that, but I'm not sure why. I'm not convinced yet. I need. Not to doubt you, Manu, but I need. If I was going to go on self discovery, I'm not sure I'm there. I'm there on a 3D universe. Mm. Your, your 3D universe is 720 degrees. We always know that. Ah. That so the other part, part, the other part degrees. that is hidden is another 720 degrees. Okay. Yeah. So I need another, I need another dimension to get to 1440. Okay. I got yeah. you. Okay, now I'm It's a unity, unity of unities. Always think that way. Yeah. I'm going to say which collapses or tucks, right? 
That's what he, he used the word tucks. It, it, it collapses or it tucks or it uh, eliminates, right? Steve, you need another S on collapses. It's a Thank perception you. of 3D. We're going to get right. into 3D in the next question. Okay, wait. Which collapses or tucks to create the, the not the illusion of 3D, but the visibility of 3D, right? Right. No. To create the visibility of, of, of 3D. Wow. I'm actually making some progress on this. Maybe, just maybe. We'll see how I feel in the morning. Okay. John, if you could. If you how many degrees of angular unity are in a tetrahedron? 1440. Yeah. No. In a tetrahedron. Yes, and let's refer back to the math we did on 24.01 definition where the, the where it's described. And then we go through our first defi definite, uh, we go through this definition and the math comes out. And finally, after three weeks, I think I have a graphic that actually shows the resolution of the problem having been corrected twice by my the the i called him a wizard in an email earlier today i said manu you must have a wizard's brain and this really is alchemy this really is wizardry but here's your tetrahedron there's the one duality i hope i have this right and don't need to correct it again one duality 360 another duality 360 that makes 720, and all I have to do is to add the other 720 to come up with 1440, and that other 720 is convex. It's in another dimension, and so it's not visible. Hmm. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I have a I have okay. a I have a bulge going on here in the left hmm. side of my frontal cortex. Comments, questions. Steve, do you remember how? in a classical geometry they have the xyz yes they take one plane like this one plane and they cut it with the other it needs two planes yes like this. and that's right. how you define xyz it's right two planes coming together right. yeah perpendicular. yeah right that is the physical one plane X, Y, and another plane coming very, uh, perpendicular to the Y to define the Z. What C is showing? And X, then, Y, Z. And then we get because to the... In doing that, you hinge the other plane. Right. Onto and, the first plane. And, and I by hinging it, by hinging it, remember, we fold it. eliminate one. is a double bonding here. Okay, good. Now let's bring up that bonding. And I want to just show you the next thing I've come up with. So here's the two-dimensional plane. We fold it now and we have 3D and we fold it one more time and we have 4D. I just thought I would show you that because when that folds one more time, there's a collapse. Anyway, I've been, I've been dreaming about this. And remember that, Steve, what you just said is absolutely interesting because when you fold it twice, that is two to the power of two. That's when you created an inside and an outside. Wonderful. And if now you look at what you showed, you, you tear it, you fold it. When you fold twice, that's when you have an inside. Hold that. Now you start having an inside and an outside. You get yeah. it? Did I have an inside and outside when I did this? No, no. You have one side and the other side. And now, when only, you fold it like that, you have now the inside. And the only way I can fold it for my for my three D my two D brain is to rip it. Otherwise, I can't imagine it. And yet, it's actually folding without being ripped. Mm -hmm. But my brain doesn't savvy that. Goes no, that's not. You got to rip it. Okay, so we went through this bonding thing. We got the tetrahedron, right? right? And then I'm gonna do a Kelly. 
Here is the bow tie. That is a single bond. Right? I hope I'm doing it right. Uh-oh. Here is a double, double bond. bond. Mm -hmm. And now I'm understanding bonding, but I don't understand it in terms of the words we're reading tonight. I don't understand it in terms of the words we're reading tonight. But I just thought I'd just do a, a Kelly. But, but Steve, you just, you, just, you just did it. I did. When you, when you tore and you glued, that is a bond. You tore and then you glue to make the inside outside. Yes, that is a bond. Because if you left it just turn, it can, you know, it is more, it's freer than when you fold it, when you fold it and you hold it like that. That nice glue is bonded. Yeah. That part is bonded. Yep, and here is an intuitive notion of bonding is restricting. Bonding means restricting freedom. Okay. To create the objective being that you bond to create a local reality. You bond from general to more and more local. Right on. You constrain. Bonding also, another, another word for bonding is constraining. Okay, good. I'm removing my props. All right. So, can, can, go ahead, go ahead, Joe. Um, is constraining related to order? No, it relates to relations. Okay. But you're still bringing, like, uh, you're defining what those relationships are. So that yes, kind of brings. But so when you constrain, as you say, you bring order. A structure is order. Okay. All right. Because in a structure, when I bring, when I come to a tetrahedron, I know that. All of my angles added together is 720 degrees. That's the definition of it. Okay. And Joe, by order, the other thing that I'm gonna word I'm gonna pop in there is anti-entropic. Yes, but anti-entropic because human. entropic exists. That's what the energy of humans do. We are yes. anti-entropic. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Susan, for reminding us of the us of a word. Because then I could start to understand what chaos means out of that too. Steve, I finally got my magnets to do the triple bondy. Oh well, cool. They they don't want to stay exactly together. Yeah. Because the, the balls aren't big enough. Exactly. And in, in actuality, those vertexes are infinite in size actually and so but the magnets we need bigger balls <laughs> okay good <laughs> i love to talk to the surgeon i love to talk dirty to the surgeon it's just really exciting to me <laughs> so <laughs> i was having an epiphany about something that manu said earlier to bring this back in, but I think we're, I'm seeing things a little more clearly than I've seen them before. Comments or questions, we'll continue reading. Okay, let's continue. Let's see what we've got so far here. Okay, well, this is the, this is your tetrahedron. So be thinking, in fact, I'm just gonna grab this guy and I'm gonna put it back over here in our reading because I don't know that I don't know exactly why that did that because that should have just sat in front of everything. Oh, I know why it did that because it wants to go in the same location it was before. It's a quirk of um, of of thing. So here we go. There's my I'm going to get rid of this guy for the time being. 
And I'm going to put this up here in the space. All right. So now reading this last little line one more time. John, do you care to indulge me and just go for that one oh, last course. line? Yeah. The remainder of zero degrees from 720 degrees is 720 degrees or two unities or one tetrahedron, QED. So here we have one unity. We have one duality of 360, the duality of 360, which makes it 720. Okay, and then we add this to this, and there's your 720. But because a tetrahedron is four vertexes times 360, or 720 based on the addition of the sides of the, uh, the angles that are projected, there are three angles around each vertex of 60 degrees. And then we have to add that convex 720 to it in order for it to, now the math works. So the remainder of zero from 720 is 720 or two unities. I hope when I wake up in the morning, I understand what those two unities are. <laughs> remember, remember this, uh, um, Steve? Yes. Is that you never talk of a tetrahedron without the entire tetrahedron. Let me put it that way. When we talk about a tetrahedron, we talk about the convex one. We imagine we are inside. Yeah. But there's always and then we talk about the concave one, but there is always implied the convex one. Exactly. That's why in this relationship, the zero point, just take the first yellow on top there, is in relationship to the other one, is a bow tie. And always. Then, so and the representation of a tetrahedron like you did here, it is incorrect in reality. This is a representation in 3D. We're talking in 4D. If you okay. really wanted to represent it, you do another one that is opening to the, I would have to say, it, another one that is linked. Ah. Gotcha. So this. You, seven, you have a bow tie. You have a bow tie. I will have a bow tie, and that's why it's 1440. Yes. You this always. Is it is, in, in Becky's reality, it is always a bow tie. Remember that. Because the yin and the yang, one cannot exist without the other. It exactly. is a duality. It is it's always a what you are talking two. about there. Yes. A minimum of two. Everybody said, I say a minimum of two thinking I'm so brilliant. And it's actually talking about something that's invisible in a three dimensional reality. Manu, I'm going to just like try and catch here. So, why is it a bow tie and not two faces? That are joined. If it's two faces, is one of what you call uh, is is something else. It is it is it is. If it's two faces, it is um, it is it is a crystal. And what is it then? It is like dead. In between, the crystal is like dead because its structure it looks like there's nothing, no exchange. It's just there, all on its own. Yeah. The crystal will be rich. Remember, Fred, mm -hmm. we all evolving, and this physical world is going to be reduced to some kind of iron. Right? That's what Fred used to say. Remember that? Yes. Everything is going to be fissile and then coming together to a dead. There no more energy, no more flow. Yeah, if there's no flow, there's no life. Yes. If cause and effect meet up, yeah, yeah, there's no more life. So you have one thing in relationship to another moving always, always. So it, it almost sounds like you're implying that the maximal amount of movement is the natural state of equilibrium. No, I haven't said so. no, I'm I'm to... saying so. I'm saying there are things that are always moving and they have six degrees of free, uh, six degrees of freedom. There are things always moving with six degrees of freedom. And we are always going to talk about this world in congruencies to 1440. 
congruence into dualities. Because if a tetrahedron is a unit and the tetrahedron is four, is 720, we know that a tetrahedron cannot exist on its own. Steve, put back a little bit, put back your array of things, your, the, your, your diagram. And I wanted to just express something. This diagram here? Yes. Okay. Now, if you had, let's just imagine that you have the first circle, right? It is a beam of light that is going like this. No, no, the first circle, the big circle. Yes, is a beam of light, something that is moving and a blue electron that is moving, right? It's describing that orbit. And then you have, if the other circle that come perpendicular was a red circle, it's, it would be a red electron that goes like that, right? What you will see is that you will see in the intersection of two arrays, you're gonna see a tetrahedron exactly. Because when they meet, we are observing, we are slow seeing, what you are, what, where, where, where the circles meet like this, one in the other like that, is going to define a tetrahedron. But that red circle exists because there was another it's spinning because there's a counter spin somewhere else. In a world that everything that touches each other, everything in relationship to each other. So if there's a positive spin, there's a negative spin. So that creates on its own the notion of convex that we don't see, but that exists in reality. It is there, but it's just that we don't see it. It's like a gear. When you, when you take a gear, gears of a clock, when one wheel is spinning this way, there is always another wheel that is spinning counter, counter, counter clockwise. Counter clockwise, that way. And it is spin, and that's whole stuff that together comes together to give us an indication of time in the space where we are living. It gives us an indication of a cycle. Right. All of that gearing, many, many, many. And it's the same for a combustor, uh, combustion engine. It is gears, gears, gears. Remember the trim tap, the, 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 the trim tap. That's what it is. So what, whatever you have represented here, it has counter, let me use the word, counterclockwise something else to make the local bow tie of your reality. Because if you were in the tetrahedron, you will not see anything that is outside of it. You have to think outside of it and imagine the way you present it to have awareness of what is real. This is a really important point, and part of me wants to go back to that video where we look at a 2D reality with the, uh, with the um, what are those people called that live in the 2D world? The Flatlanders. In order to understand a 2D universe, you got to be in a third dimension. If you're not, if I'm not in a, if I don't think three dimensionally, I will not understand a two dimensional reality. And then I, I still have to do metaphors and I still have to do uh, likenesses. In order to understand a 3D reality, I need to move into four dimensions. And that's exactly what this tetrahedron represents is a four dimensional reality. Um, and I've come to see this as, where this, this tetrahedron is built because the angles between all of these vertexes are 60 degrees. In reality, they're probably 90 degrees, but I can't comprehend four things at 90 degrees with themselves. But I can comprehend four things at 60 degrees with themselves. So I've come to see this tetrahedron as a manifestation, a metaphor of 4D. And I want to say one other thing while I'm on a roll is that I remember the thing that um, that you said, Manu, 
that um, I wanted to uh, point out. Bucky talks about, you brought this out, Bucky talks about relationship. And um, in normal physics, a scientist will talk about a connection. But the word connection is way too shallow because that connection is actually occurring at at least six different levels. So to say these two, um, these two tetrahedron are connected is a way simplification. These two tetrahedra are in relationship. Yes. And that relationship manifests within the six degrees of freedom. And there's two, so it's 12 degrees of freedom that are manifesting here. This is a relationship, it's not a simple connection. It's not like plugging in my electric, uh, my electric cord of my lamp into the wall and saying, I'm connected. There's a major relationship going on between the, the, the electromagnetic current and my wall and that lamp. And to say it's connected is like saying, Jesus is just like Santa Claus. <laughs> and you just say something important, Steve. The first me that is real is in the tetrahedron. When I look at my environment, the tetrahedron, I see six relationships, right? Yeah. I see the six edges. Right. There's that relationship. The other guy, the other dwar, that is in the other tetrahedron, he's seen also six. When we come together, it is 12 in total. Right on. That's why the sphere, remember the sphere, it represents it with 12 vertices. Yeah. Now, I also want to just promote meditation because I'm going to argue that when I sit to meditate, I move, I invite myself to move out of the box. I'm inviting myself to move out of my body and to be out here and look in. And I'm looking into the core. And I move actually, when I sit, I'm sitting in 4D. And I could only tell you that after 30 years of sitting, I can't prove it, but I can just say it. Go ahead, Susan. Almost certainly you're more than 4D. Say again? Almost certainly you're more than four dimensions. Oh, absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. And what- oh, I the four mean, dimension is the minimum, remember? It's the tetrahedron is the minimum state and of what a I'm, What I'm tempted to do here is, this, is to go to, I think I could find it quickly, but there's a really cool um, um, video that first shows a uh, two-dimensional reality in 3D, then shows a three-dimensionality in 4D. And one can actually visualize a sphere moving out of the fourth dimension into the third dimension, starting as a dot and expanding into a circle. And it only manifests as big as that four dimensional object wants to be in that space. And the more that 4D object moves in the space, the bigger it gets and the further it gets out, the smaller it gets. Just like in that 2D example, when the balloon comes up through the 2D reality, at first it starts like a dot and then it grows into a circle and then it goes back to a dot again as the balloon moves through. Oh, I grabbed the bow tie instead of the simple one. As the balloon moves through the 2D plane, it changes its shape to the 2D people. The 3D people see it not changing. Same thing with, I'm convinced that most of the reality that I see in my daily life is a four dimensional reality manifesting in 3D to the degree that I'm allowing myself to see it. And because I'm still looking at the old pop cans in my car, I don't see the big pop can of the universe. <laughs> it's captured Steve, with the Steve, Steve, what you are saying is the movie that we saw, we saw on Tuesday, uh, on, on Wednesday. That's what Bucky does with Vegeta Box. Yeah. From the most expanded, yeah. 20 vertexes, you come down. Yeah. And part of me wants to show that. Uh, let's see if I can find it very quickly. Susan, while I find the jitterbug, um, what did you say? So our eyes actually are capturing a representation of 3D reality into two-dimensional clips. And our binocular vision and our 
our brain mind is collating a three-dimensional representation out of two-dimensional perceptions of what is at least a 3D reality, if not 4D. So each, found... per each perception collapses at least one dimension. Each perception collapses at least one dimension. Brilliant. Okay, I found the jitterbug uh, thing and um, and I'm about ready to show that if that's okay with everybody. Is there any comments or questions? I'm not trying to hijack this, but maybe seeing these dimensions collapse might be helpful. I think it will be helpful because yes. that's, that's really, Everybody really- have consensus? Okay, here we go. Yes. Um, share, expand, and play. Oop. Flexor equilibrium where the radii have been removed, that is explosives. And it is equilibrium is, is a very a completely unstable condition. <laughs> that is when uh, when we first had submarines, we used to fill the water ballast tanks so it was just at equilibrium. And then if anybody happened to drop a monkey wrench, we could throw the balance out and they would tend to nose over and, and get into radio trouble. When we began flying, then we came to what we call the star. <clears throat> star at the same point when at the equilibrium at the star, anything could happen, can go at any kind of a spin. Mm. Nature upheld that equilibrium. She always, everything you and I know will always be one side or the other of the equilibrium. At any rate, this is the most expensive form of the of these vectors that I gave you. Now here's vector equilibrium. Can can you can everybody see this all right? And I'm going to take this top face and move it lower towards the face on the floor. And this top triangle is not allowed to twist. You can only approach the triangle on the floor. You've got two planes approaching each other. You understand? So this means and I think see they're at 90 degrees of each other right now. One's going one way, the other's going the other way. Or are they 180 degrees of each other? Because this triangle is is pointing that direction, and this triangle is pointing this direction. Anyway, just notice that. I noticed it, so we can comment later. This vertex will always be towards you. Yeah. And vertex in the floor is towards me. So I gotta do this. Suddenly it's collapsed to where the square are changing. They become diamonds, then ridge pole diamonds. Now the distance between the the vertex is is such that the line is exactly the same as the other vectors. Therefore, I put in six vectors there and you have the icosahedron. This is the icosahedron. Vector equilibrium then comes down to the first stable form, which is the icosahedron. The vector equilibrium itself consisted of eight tetrahedra, each of a volume of one, six one half octahedra. Half octahedra is two, so six of two is 12. 12 and, and eight are 20. The vector equilibrium volume is 20. And so now it collapses. I want to say that tininess of the vector equilibrium gets tightened up into the icosahedron with another set of vectors. The, 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 the six more introduced, or one more unit of quantum. Now I'm going to keep lowering that triangle towards the one for not twisting at all. And now it suddenly contracts to become the octahedron. Mm. This is a beautiful thing you watch. All the vertexes approach common center at a, a common rate. This absolutely symmetrical expansion comes by up here and now contracts the other way. But the, the axis in my hands never rotates. Only the, only the crater is rotating. Now I can go, supposing this is rotating in space, a group of stars, there's a, a mass, there's a mass attraction pull of another set of stars. And one then 
this is trying to turn, and then it restrains this. It, what, what happens when you do that would be then, I move this around, forces it to contract. If it's being forced to contract that way, then remember, notice this rotating this way. This rotates more and plunges right through and becomes the tetrahedron. We've gone all the way from vector equilibrium, icosahedron, octahedron, vector equilibrium. The octahedron is double bonded, tetrahedron is quadruple bonded, quadrivalent, we call it. This is where diamonds are in respect to carbon. <clears throat> we have no, no point that we make open. So the <coughs> maximum space employed by unity is, is a vector equilibrium, but all the structures are within it. <laughs> they're they're co contracted wrong from the whole. Now notice that this can then tetrahedron. I, I had it plunge that through like that. This can then immediately reverse itself and tetrahedron can turn inside out. <laughs> Just as it actually spontaneously. Basic pumping. <clears throat> that, that, that identifies vector equilibrium and introduces a hierarchy of accounting. Comments, questions. Hello, guys. Who doesn't, who's not in love? Now. Who's not uh -huh. in love? Nah. <laughs> Absolutely right. I mean, this is everything in how much? Four minutes? Everything in four minutes. The first thing that was the most important is that everything is in relationship. Did you see that the vector equilibrium has 12 vertices and all of them were in relationship, right? Initially, Susan, everything was in relationship, isn't it? When he held it, the most expanded, everything on relationship. Right. Second thing, what was the most important? Is angle, it is rotation. He only talks of rotations. From that, it just rotations. And he went, from one, the most expanded, through the different stable. You know, remember that the stable forms are discrete. The vector equilibrium is very unstable. He said it at the beginning. It is an equilibrium that is very unstable. But through turning, rotation, you come to discrete form that are stable. Icosahedra, octahedra, and then the beautiful tetrahedron. And it showed in there two things of a tetrahedron. One is quadruple bonded. It is the same energy that we had that has now been compressed, compressed, compressed. Imagine that when the inside is shrinking, the density is going up, isn't it? Density being more restrained more restraint, giving more less space until that thing collapsed into a form that is the tetrahedron, four bonded, quadruple bond. It showed you each of the two vertices of the tetrahedron had four bonds, had four sticks, right? And then from there also, it showed you that the tetrahedron is the only stuff that inside out is the same. He showed it there. He moved it in and he sucked it completely out to show what was inside, outside. It was still a tetrahedron. In the set theory, that is called the neutral element. Right. It transformed into itself. It is the basic, and he, and he talked about the hierarchy of accounting. Yes. So in our design, what have you in your plan, in your casting, not taken into account? We can't take into account everything from the beginning, but we start and we put our mind in the mode of learning. That is when there's new evidence or new things, 
we account for it. And if something that we accounted in a certain order is no more relevant, we put it on a back burner. We don't discard it. We put it on the back burner. If it is there, it has a certain purpose that we don't know yet. So you put it in a back burner, meaning that you can always, it is a kind, not that you child, child, would I say childfully? Yeah, you childfully forget about it. Go about like it doesn't exist anymore. No, it is in the back burner. And you are ready for something to trigger that. Yeah, there is that stuff in there. Now it's time for me to act anti-entropically to account for it. How powerful is that? In the way, not only do we understand <clears throat> our universe and how it, uh, it operates, but how do we learn a heuristic, something, a way for us to more consciously live about and relate about in that universe. Those are my comments. Cool. It's like Kelly always asks, right? What's the boundary? So that you understand what the boundary is, so that you know what to analyze. All right. That's the first question you always ask, Kelly. I was like, right. And I noticed that that the figure he started with was the icosahedron, and that is that puppy right there. Yeah. Right. Which is inside the octahedron. Which you can start to extract. So the icosahedron, but, but remember this. The icosahedron in our reality from inside is more expanded than the octahedron. It's more expanded, yeah. But it's also fractal. Right. Yes. So, so we, are, we are learning it from a way. It's like we went macro first and we come in micro to see it. But the reality is that it existed macro. In our, I don't know how to express it. It is more expanded. The volume of the aquasidra is a multiple of a volume of the octahedron. So and Nassim he, Harriman talks about the idea of arriving at the vector equilibrium as a female rotating, meaning the male rotating icosahedron and merging like a Merkaba. And so it attains this three-dimensional structure of the expanded vector equilibrium. And they actually have a company that has tuned artificial silica crystals in a double torus resonator. Thank you for the organic parts. Like the male and the female. It's like it's, <laughs> it's like that it's it's like understanding that there's always a unity. So you have that and in 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 chemistry, it's it's stereochemistry. It's how does the light bend? Does it bend to the right? Does it bend to the left? And it's the unity of the two merging together. See that merge, that fused Merkaba. It's the two tetrahedrons not approaching each other at this fabulous single degree of unity bow tie. It's the fused diamond where the power just crashes out from the center. Actually, life is in a diamond, isn't it? The creation of life, the act of what we call procreation is in a diamond. Yep. The diamond is the is octahedron the the diamond um, crystal is octa is an octahedron. So you go vector equilibrium icosahedron octahedron tetrahedron tetrahedron below the event horizon to octahedron to icosahedron to vector equilibrium, and then it 
flashes. Exactly. Double toros, Steve. That is your double toros, that's the hierarchy in it. It, come, it disappears in a black hole and it reappears in a white hole. Disappear in a black hole, reappears in a white hole. That's the way it is, like that, always. We, we kind of showed that last time, my little thing about that. What I was really impressed with last time was the yin and yang thing. Um, but I think I can get to this pretty quickly. Yeah. The little dot. People don't see the little dot, the black dot and the white dot on the yin and yang. Yeah. And here it is here. And I've got to find it and share it. Where's our thing? Here we go. Bam. And hold it. That's not it. It was right here. But that one wasn't as cool as the one that I found on the internet. That was even better. That shows the ninety degree angle of the, of the, uh, of the black of the uh, black and red one. Yeah, the black and red thing. Um, let me think here. Oh my gosh, I got stuff that this panel gets in the way. I'm not going to be. Here's history. Maybe I can find it real fast right here. Okay, comments, questions while I'm looking for this. I don't want to drive anybody crazy. No comments or questions? Gosh, we didn't even get to triangles, but I we did lines last week, but we're redoing them this week, and it seems to make sense. I think I've made better sense of lines this week than ever before. And I'm never going to say ever again that anything is connected. I'm going to say it's in an interrelationship. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, well, I'm looking for stuff and I'm not conducting the meeting. Okay, it's 925. There's only seven of us here. But maybe it's just time to, there's been a lot going on in this in this time tonight. Um, maybe what we could do is look at the um, look at the Bucky words and see if there's anything that um, maybe look at this Bucky chart. Maybe this would be helpful for a little while. Anything coming up for you here as we look at this? That's why I went to Egypt. Mm. Very cool. I like the word conceptual arrangement of relationship on that table, see? Right there. Yep. Conceptual rela arrangement of relationships. Of number relationships. Yeah. It right. sees what it is relations. Yeah, and they occur as diamonds, not as squares. Because if I, I watching Bucky with his jitterbug thing, it almost looked like it was going to go to a square and it went down into an octahedron. It looked like it was going to be a square and it went into an octahedron. So I'll make sure the that square, that, the square is not stable. Remember it's not that. stable. Believe it's me. It's not I, stable. Yes. I built squares with magnets. They do not stay stable. And no, it's not guy, stable. It's not a stable form. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it would be cool like to summarize the words here. Um, maybe, maybe John, the way to end this is to is to read uh, 24, uh, 22405 one more time and just allow the words to echo in. John, do you mind reading that one last time? Oh, sure. So 22405, okay. Line. A line has two vertexes with angles around each of its vertexial ends equal to zero degrees. The sum of these angles is zero degrees. The sum of the vertexes, two, times angular unity, 360 degrees, is 720 degrees. 
the remainder of zero degrees from 720 degrees is 720 degrees or two unities or one tetrahedron, QED. Right on. So what I thought we might do is grab that tetrahedron. Oops, that's in the wrong place and just throw it up there. So anyway, uh, that's it for tonight, folks. Um, and I, I'll put the tetrahedron on that later when I pass it out to everybody. So, Joe, how are you feeling and what's your takeaway tonight? And you can talk for quite a while because we're way ahead of this. This bus is just slowly moving in. So go for it, my friend. Um, well, thank you everybody for all your comments and, you know, and helping me understand this. Uh, and and uh, the video actually was very, very helpful. It was helpful last week, but it was very helpful this week as well. Um, I try to put this into some, well, on a, on a, on a, on a, literal level, I mean, I understand the angular unity in a much greater detail. Uh, so how we walk through what it looks like in, you know, a 2D system and and then uh, how we got to 720 and then how it looks in a 4D universe too and how we get to 1440. We've gone through that before, but it's just a little bit more clear as walking through those kind of just step-by-step. But uh, understanding what it means to be in a relationship is probably the next most important thing to me. Um, because once we can, as I was talking about, is that understand uh, that pulling out and understanding the boundaries initially, we can analyze something, but then we can start to look at how it relates to the whole. And so that allows us to see other connections and uh, relationships, not connections. Um, and that's a really big distinction that I'm taking away from this evening. Um, and we can do that in, that, that in a very practical sense uh, we, when we're looking at things. Uh, and you can look at that as well as in uh, from, I, I hate to always reduce it to something as trivial as something like business, but even, but, uh, even in our lives. Uh, how these relationships work together. Um, uh, and those are my major takeaways. I mean, if um, I have some other notes related to my cl the collapse and, and the event horizon that I need to revisit. Um, and then uh, just chaos and order notes as well um, when it comes to bonding and and restricting freedom. Um, but those are things I have to revisit with my notes just to articulate them more clearly. But um, yeah, so that those are my major takeaways from this evening. So uh, let me see. Raffers, how do you feel and what are you taking away from this evening? Thank you, Joseph. Actually, again, <clears throat> again to me, this is an area that's still getting on the way of, get, of being actually clearer, huh? but, but funny enough, I'm clear today than I was last week about, you know, <clears throat> two dimensions, 3D and four, di four dimensions. And also the, the fact that we could re revisit the video with, with Bucky demonstrating how, how the universe actually falls and what, sort of, and what structures are stable. Mm. The fact that we move away from you know squares, multiple thinking in squares, or even we both use the expression out of the box, a box is a square. So I think that's a concept we need to again get get, get rid of and think about. You know, let me get out of the of my tetrahedron so I can actually look what's outside, not just what I see from the faces and from within, and the importance of Repeat the word connection for relations and interrelations. And I think I agree, I agree you can relate that to the world because if we understand relations and interrelations, we, we can understand a lot better. You see what, what's happening in today's world because we're looking at the connections, we tend to connect the dots, for example. I'm not saying that that's irrelevant or not important, 
which is more important to analyze the relationship and the interrelationship within the dots. And we, we, we can create four dots, and that's a tetrahedron. A tetrahedron, then we, can, we, we get a clear understanding of how things relate and how we create stable, more stable structures. So that's my takeaway today. So Manu, my friend, how do you feel and what do you take away? I feel uh, good. I feel grateful and thankful uh, that all of us are here and really exchanging and trying to grasp and to get our hands around what's been said here. And uh, I also feel privileged that everybody here give the most they have in a very sincere way, in a very uh, outwardly just given. And that is good for our growth, that is good for our understanding. Um, what I take the most here is that if you start understanding what Becky was saying, it really, to me, empowers you to be more effective locally and to be more, let's just call it, I wouldn't even want to use the word robust, to be more comprehensive. And it actually gives you a method in that we don't discard things, we put them in a back burner because we don't know yet what to do with them. We are aware that they are there, but we don't know their use. And if they are there, they have a particular function in our universe. So the best we can do is to temporarily put it aside and not forget it, but be ready, be aware that of circumstances that reveal to ourselves in such a way that if serendipitously or by chance or whatever the case, we will find a way to use it or to account for them in a way that makes more sense. And that help us designing things that hopefully are regenerative. And that's really what the strength that I take from this meeting that we have. And above all the friendship, and, and to see Kelly here for the second time in a row, there will be a third, there will be four. So there's, to me, I'm really happy about that. Um, so that's, it's as simple as that. Uh, Susan, how do you feel? What do you take away? I feel regenerated in the company of connection and I know we've kind of moved connection into the realm of relation and interrelation. And so I would like to kind of offer you kind of the foreness in which I live. And that is mind and soul and heart and body. And while the distance between us keeps us from being in physical presence with each other, we have the option of coming into an relationship and interrelationship of mind and soul and heart, even at this distance. Mm -hmm. um, I am bringing in all the things that we are, are learning and experiencing with the very kind of wonderful experience that I had where Kelly invited me back into the group, which was that resonant science sort of an experience where we took a bunch of people at grassroots who started to care about spherical geometry and resolution of relationships. And whether Nassim has a handle on it or not, his experience of looking at the relationship of spherical geometry and subatomic structure brought about the idea of a black hole at the center of every proton. And so when you work through the fun 
amazing math of that. That means 10 to the power of 40. 10 to the power of 40 connections at the level of every proton. And when we start to look at the jitterbug movement of energy of vector equilibriums pulsing through that, that connect us, that relate us, that interrelate us, it, it tends to show to me why there's this possibility of a critical mass could be as small as only the square root of 1% where if all of us will conspire, if we will breathe together in the possibility, in the optimism of what Bucky taught us in Utopia versus Oblivion, it's, you know, optimism is its own reward, pessimism is its own reward, I'm going to choose. And I believe that what we do on this call is my highest expression of spirituality, it's a movement towards, towards utopia, towards the possibility of utopia. Um, you know, the whole idea of being incarnate has so many restrictions, you know, trying to, to shove this amazing soul that we all have into a, you know, 3D versus 4D, however you want to size it up, reality is preposterous and yet it's an amazing opportunity so kelly when i look at the fact that your body has given challenges to your heart to your soul to your mind i am grateful with every cell of my being for the fact that you are here <laughs> and even if your physical body weren't here every bit of what you've intended has it manifests into the future with so many people. Every single day I meet uh, typically about 20 people that I share the beauty and the energy of what perception you all bring to me and the hope that that generates to people where they're at at that moment and where they will take it in the future. So I am looking to uh, understand these relationships and interrelationships so much more because there's a lot that we are tasked to do with them. Kelly, how do you feel and what are you taking away? Uh, I'm feeling uh, embiggered that I got through the whole thing and <clears throat> you know I'm starting to get a glimpse of what we're talking about which is big for me because you know I'm really in a, a funk about everything and it's important that I get back to where I was at and I appreciate it very selfishly I appreciate everything that everyone else on the call does uh, I'm only able to listen because I'm not fast enough to uh, to respond. So thank you for allowing me to be part of it. Um, with that, John Butler, how do you feel and what do you take away? Kelly, this has been a very strange call for a lot of reasons. Um, Susan, thank you for sharing so much of your heart and being with us. And Kelly, thank you for being here because you've been a part of my life for over 30 years. And in fact, um, when Di and I established our current firm, we were um, quite inspired by a lot of the work we'd done around Bucky's work. So for example, um, for those of you who can see it, the tetrahedron okay. is an important part <laughs> of our firm. Um, it's, Bucky's a big part of our foundation. And um, it's just, it's such a complex world in some ways with so much happening around us and uh, questions of who, if anybody is telling the truth and who you can trust and what is going on. And yet life is really so simple. Di and I have been working recently, uh, part of a study group on Eckhart Tolle 
and mm. we're working to achieving greater consciousness and being able to be present and avoid the pain body or minimize our pain bodies, which is a great experience. Um, you are all strange. You're all strange in many ways. You're strange, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Part of this <laughs> strange group, stretching our brains and Kelly, yours isn't the only one that hurts, I can tell you. Um, with complex shapes and concepts, but all it's about is um, connection, connection with each other, wanting to be better people, wanting to contribute uh, in better ways, in more ways to a world that badly needs it. So look, I struggle here some weeks. I'm really grateful to be here this week. Glad to be part of all this. Um, uh, just hoping to be a slightly better person for this and, and really grateful to you for your relationships, whatever we form together, whatever shape we take. So uh, I don't know where that leaves me, but, but Raffers, how do you feel and what do you take away from today? I've already, I've already gone. So I think it's Steve now. Oh, gone. Steve. Hey. Um, no. Uh, no, I've been. Yeah. Gone as well. <laughs> John was the last guy left on my list. So, okay. um, <clears throat> except for me, um, I'm still uh, being possessed by those uh, empty Diet Coke cans. Uh, <laughs> because uh, what a profound little thing to share on your first meeting with Kelly. And I'm looking at how many empty Coke cans I have or <laughs> boxes full of stuff I have over here in my cave as I'm moving into this new chapter of my life. Um, so I'm just really grateful. I'm going to stay with the Coke cans for, for a big thing. That's my big takeaway today. Um, this, the idea of, I, I've thought I've understood precession. Uh, I had the little uh, mnemonic peg memorized, you know, Soviet P and I've been for months been talking about six degrees of freedom and how everything's happening simultaneously. And suddenly I'm seeing old videos of how spinning automatically creates torque. And, you know, and say, oh my gosh, this precession thing has been around forever, all these six degrees of freedom. And I'm just now seeing it. it's like I'm waking up to this. This concept of interrelationship, uh, you know, um, it comes back to this sense of consciousness that everything has with itself. And um, this interrelationship thing is really powerful. And the idea that it, that it might involve me somehow. I'm so grateful to be in interrelationship with each of you. I'm so grateful to be invited here. And I'm grateful to be the guy who pushes the buttons on the Zoom. <laughs> and I'm grateful to be in a with so much great feedback. Manu, you did great today. Susan, you were great today. Joe, I loved your questions. John, thank you for participating. Raffers, you're the, uh, the silent grease that keeps the wheel going here. And, um, and the other thing I'm taking away is this idea of being accountable to a 2D perspective, accountable to a 3D perspective, accountable to a 4D perspective and understand that accounting is really what sets the boundaries and all that in which I'll, I get to step from one level or one reality to another reality and I get to live in my Coke cans if I want to. So I'm really grateful for, for tonight <laughs> and really honored for being able to do this. I'm going to have an operation on Wednesday on my eyeball. Uh, you know, they tell me I'll be fine, um, but I will be for the Wednesday morning meeting. I'll be there because my operation's at 7 or 7.30 and this meeting's at 6. So I'll be there and we'll talk about our agenda for the weekend and I should be okay. But I really think moving into four dimensions and really talking about that would be great for me, but we're gonna decide we wanna stick to Bucky as much as we can. So we can just keep reading Bucky. You guys are my heroes. And uh, we're going to land this bus 12 minutes early to make up for last week. So I feel really excited about that. <laughs> so peace be unto you. And thank you all very much.
Thank you, Steve. Right. Thank you, Steve. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Hey, Manu. You're my hero. Uh -huh. That was great. Thank you, wizard. You're my wizard. See you later. Bye.